Howdy folks, welcome to Daily Coin. My name is Rory and today is uh, Friday, November the 9th and I have the very distinct honor and I'm very excited to welcome to the show for the first time somebody whose work I've just recently been introduced to and come to find out we have a lot in common and he's, he's highly intelligent. I love this man's mind. We've been speaking for about a half an hour uh, before we started recording and come to find out he's an amateur goat farmer. He is a uh, retired, if you will, pro chemist. He's in one of my favorite attributes that he has is that he's a southerner in training. And I'm speaking of Tom Luongo. Tom, welcome to the Daily Coin. Thank you, Rory. It's really great to be here. I appreciate the invite. Well, I'm glad that you're here, and you can find all of Tom's great work over at tomluongo.me. There's a link provided in the uh, description box below, and when, once you arrive at his site, you will see across the top, which is beautiful, just one of the things that I love most is it's gold, goats, and guns, and he's written for uh, people like Russia Insider, which I have a lot of respect for, Newsmax, Halsey News, Seeking Alpha. And and um, so we're and now strategic and actually now strategic culture found foundation, foundation as well. Strategic uh, culture, yeah, the, yeah. I have been seeing a lot of your work over there, mm -hmm. and which is that's I, I really respect what they're doing. So that's great that you're that you're working with those guys because that is that is one of the highest quality, in my opinion, geopolitical websites anywhere to be found. Uh, absolutely. I, uh, I got the call from them. I got an email from them a few months ago, actually, uh, out of the blue, uh, saying, asking me if I wanted to be a, a writer for them. And I'm like, sure. Um, because, you know, I mean, let's not, let's not mince words or anything. For those who don't know, strategic culture is a Moscow based think tank. Um, and, uh, and, my, my only problem was, you know, how much to charge them per article because I wasn't sure how, how much money they actually have. But, you know, I sat down, I had already uh, made some acquaintances with some of their other regular writers in the past, having worked for, you know, having written for Russia Insider and, and some others and some other sites. And, and uh, I was able to, uh, you know, we were able to come, come to an arrangement, which was great. Uh, and then uh, but I mean, some of those writers over there are actually patrons of mine now. So That's great over Patreon. So uh which is which is also great. So there's this, you know, the way I, I kind of look at it. I was talking with Lee Stranahan um, a couple months ago, or, uh, or about a month ago, on my uh, I did on my podcast an interview with him, and he said one of the things that we're I'm trying to do here is to build a, a kind of a nexus or a community of resistance to the dominant narrative about what's happening geopolitically, and it's and it centers around sites like Strategic Culture, Lou Rockwell, Zero Hedge. Um, and others, and uh, and hopefully, you know, in that conversation, you know, all the smaller sites like mine, yours, and and the others, and we build that kind of nexus of of uh, narrative resistance because it's necessary. It needs to be done, and we all need to kind of be supporting each other in that respect in order to build that community and reinforce it. Because if we don't, they're going to pick us off one by one, and it's going to be very ugly. That's correct, and they are they are trying. Google is. Uh, I've been under attack uh, from those those guys. Since uh, October 2016, it's very obvious they they mm -hmm. de the Google de-indexed over the course of three days in in October of 2016. They de-indexed 135,000 pages from my website, and I get wow. a report every day where they de-index, you know, this or that, and it's just wow. so I'm in, I'm basically invisible to Google or to any search because all even like DuckDuckGo or Start Page or any of the other major search engines, they all use the Google algorithm. They, right. they mask it in different ways and they mask your information and so forth, but they're they're still feeding off of the same algorithm. So yep. the dailycoin.org, you just it's very difficult to find me. It's a wonder I get any traffic at all, to be perfectly honest. I want to. I want to get into. I want to start with the obvious. I mean, we just we just came through the midterm elections, sure, and it was you know disaster from one perspective, beautiful from another perspective. Just a big, like you said, you described it perfectly. It's a big bowl of oatmeal. And mm -hmm. we're oh, the midterms find, definitely. What's that? Yeah, def definitely the midterms. Absolutely. Yeah, and 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 it's. Uh, I mean. From your from your perspective and from and the research that you do, because you you like myself, you look at a at a, at a myriad of of subjects and topics, right. and, and it's great. Uh, 
But what are your thoughts on the midterm elections? And was this more of a distraction or was there some actual meat on the bone? Oh, there's a lot of meat on these bones. I, I'm, as a matter of fact, you know, I, I was a little late getting started with my morning routine. I didn't get a blog post done before you and I started recording. Uh, so I'm working on a blog post right now, literally talking about what the midterms mean, because obviously I staked a lot of, I, I made a lot of very bold statements coming into the midterms about what would happen. Um, and I'm, and I stick by most of them other than the house loss. Uh, I think actually the midterms ex went exactly the way I expected, which is that the Democrats proved that no matter how much money they throw at uh, statewide races in the face of Donald Trump and the voter anger that he represents, right? Because Donald Trump is, doesn't exist on, in his own. He's not, he's a vessel. He's not a, he's not a thing. He's a vessel for our anger and our frustration as to the direction that this country and this world is going. And it's, um, yes, it's what he is. He is the, um, he is the, uh, the, the inheritor of Ron Paul's awakening of the silent majority back in 2008. Couldn't agree more. Right. So that's where we are. So if you look at what happened in this house in, in this midterm election, this is something I, I discounted because I tend to be a half a glass, half full kind of guy, right? I'm willing to make bold predictions that are over, that are a little overly bullish because, you know, again, I like to take the long view on things and to take the big strategic view on on things and it, it's a failing that's not you know i'm not perfect right so and my and my take on this was that you know with the 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 culture war is pretty much over these people are Im immolating themselves every day uh in in their insanity i mean they're they're doxing and going to beating on the doors of tucker carlson's house now yeah i mean this is where we are and we haven't even gotten started yet we got two more years of this up before the the, the next election so jumping around here a little bit, but the, the, the core here is that wherever Trump went and put his imprimatur on a candidate, that candidate won. Yes. And the house loss is a referendum on Paul Ryan's vile betrayal of the voters who he's supposed to represent as speaker of the house by continue, by, by obstructing everything Trump wanted to do because Paul Ryan was a Democrat. You know, when I, when I write about Paul Ryan, I just always, Paul Ryan, open parentheses, D dash Wisconsin, close parentheses. I mean, he is, if not, you know, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll even, you know, mock that up every once in a while, you know, you know, MIC Wisconsin or whatever, you know, who they actually represent. And Paul Ryan was a Democrat and he always has been a Democrat and his job was to do exactly that. And he delivered the outcome that I think. Um, he wanted, which was to obstruct to the point where the House would be blamed for not implementing the main planks, domestic planks of Trump's agenda, which were um, border security, immigration control, and the repeal of Obamacare. Yep. These are three major, and I'm not the only one saying this. Tucker Carlson's been saying it. Hey. And Coulter's been saying it. Yep. You know, uh, Carlson's rant from last night, his 15-minute thing from last night, is brilliant. Brilliant. Uh, it's, it's one it of the best really, that really, really done good. in a while. Yes. yes, it was really, really good. And really it'll, it'll get linked in that article uh, when I get finished with it because it was really good. My wife made me want, listen to it and watch it this morning before um, I even had any coffee, <laughs> uh, which was not fair, honestly. <laughs> Especially since I was up till especially since I was up till two thirty last night and I was, you know, working on four hours sleep. I'm like, honey, I really need a cup of coffee before we do this. All right, fine. I'll, but she was on her way out the door to take my daughter to school, so we had to get it done quick. All right, fine. So I think that the referendum here, the the real main takeaway here is that Trump is secure as long as he now takes the Senate advantage, which he hasn't been able to use, to get the judiciary taken care of, to get his to to clean up his cabinet, and which he already started doing by getting rid of Jeff Sessions. And that's a good and bad move, but I think it's a brilliant move from a variety of um, uh, a variety of perspectives, and it's bad in some other ways. Um, and then, you know, he can take care of his cabinet, he can take care of the judiciary stuff, and he can take care of the Supreme Court, because can, you know Ruth Bader Ginsburg fell down and broke three ribs, and if she did yep. break three ribs, she's going to be dead in ninety days. And I don't mean that to be blunt or cruel or dance on her grave or anything. She's 85 or 86 years old. Right. She's got three broken ribs. If she can't breathe properly, she's going to get pneumonia. Yes. And that's just, that's just reality when you're talking about somebody that old and that infirm. Um, and you know, I don't wish her ill, even though I don't like her. Um, and I can, you know, I can put on my, 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 my heartless libertarian hat and say, well, you know, you get what you deserve when you're that evil, but, um, I'm not going to. 
uh, you know, it's a shame that it would end this way. I would hope that she had just bowed out gracefully, but she was too much of an ideologue, or is too much of an ideologue to do so. Well, she said um, she she said that she would never retire. That's what she said. Right. She said she would gonna never re- she would never leave the Supreme Court, and that she wanted to that her goal was to outlive uh, Trump's uh, administration, so that oh. he would not be able to replace her. That was oh. her goal. I know, and you know, spite keeps people alive a long time. I know my grandfather lived until he was 93 so um <sighs> terrible but that's who she is and it's the same thing with john yeah. mccain that guy left chemo right can you let that guy left chemotherapy yes. he, he 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 to come back to the senate to fly all the way back across the country come back yeah. to the senate to walk on the floor and to very dramatically vote down the repeal of obamacare yes he's one of the biggest sons of bitch i have ever seen in my entire life yeah you know, pardon my French, but that's just, that's it's just wild. wrong. Human being. It's just wrong on so many it levels. Is. Very, so many levels. Um, and um, so got, got news for you, Rory. Here's the problem. Okay. It only gets worse from here. <laughs> well, thanks for the, we've only thanks seen for the ray of sunshine. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I'm a glass half full kind of guy. Well, you know, the best I got for you is that this is only going to get worse. And I think I wrote an article on Monday called What Price Crazy? Yes. And the Democrats are going to define for us. If they had lost, if they had, if the Republicans had held the, the House, do you, can you imagine what we would be dealing with this morning? Every, every person, every conservative in the House and the, and the Senate would be, would have Antifa on their front door, just like Tucker Carlson did. Mm-hmm. Every single one of them. Uh, I mean, a lot of this is, a lot of this is, you know, astroturfing and, it's all paid. A lot of it's paid for. Oh, Not yes. all of it's paid for. The ringers are paid for. Yes. The ground troops, the 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 brown shirts, the brown they're not shirts. paid for. Those yeah. are honestly crazy gaslit kids that do not have any sense of reality, and uh, and you know they don't have any prospects either. And this is what happens right. when you destroy an entire generation's prospects. That's right. Why Matteo Salvini in um, Italy is so popular? He's trying to bring back hope to the younger generation. And um, it's the same thing that Trump is trying to do here. Yep. You know, and I live in the rural South, North Florida. Those who know my, know me well know, know that. And, and I live amongst, you know, good, hardworking, diligent, um, you know, kind of classic Southern black folk. They're wonderful people. And I sincerely doubt any of them voted for Andrew Gillum, for example. Yeah. You know, because they, they, they don't want a handout. They want to be left alone. They want people to get out of their way. Right. And it's, it's you know, they, they want to be left to pursue their their bliss like everybody else. And I think Trump's got a real good opportunity to, to, to nail down uh, in this midterm now, given that he's got Pelosi to fight against, as opposed to ha- having to, as opposed to you know, fighting against Pelosi is easy. Fighting against Paul Ryan is a harder sell because he's supposed to be on your side. Right. So Ryan can make Trump look like the like like a child, whereas Trump can make Pelosi look like the child now. Right? Especially if he opens up the investigations into uh, into her and Diane Feinstein and all the rest. Oh well, yeah, he could those. he could do all that, and he's spiteful enough and and to and enough of a narcissist to do that. But I'm yes. thinking much simpler than that. Right. I was you know uh, just think this way. I have been saying, I said this months ago, I actually said this to my newsletter subscribers uh, earlier in the year, well, uh, which is after the midterms and the Republicans either hold serve or, um, you know, are still in a better position. There was never any worry that they were going to lose the Senate or lose their, lose any ground in the Senate. They should gain a, a, a real majority in the Senate that Trump will be able to go after a marijuana legalization, which is a Democrat's issue. Especially with all of these freshmen that Pelosi is not having to ride herd over, these are all dyed in the wool, friggin' crazy socialists like Ocasio Cortez. Exactly. Like these kids are, they're, they're these these people are nuts, and so they're gonna. It's gonna be harder for Pelosi to to keep keep them whipped into shape about upst- He's gonna give them something they really want, and then he ties that to a further middle class tax cut. So look, we'll horse trade here. You give me a, um, a a middle class tax cut, I'll give you marijuana legalization. Hell, I just got rid of Jeff Sessions for you. Exactly. 
and you know how is how are how are my 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 upper middle class or my middle class white middle class liberal friends in Gainesville, twenty miles down the road, going to argue with getting rid of Jeff Sessions and pushing for marijuana legalization? How are they going to stay in their NPC mode of orange man bad with that? Or they're going to say, oh, we can't cut taxes on the middle class. Are you kidding? He's, yeah. You know, they, they, Pelosi can't fight that. No, no, she can't. And, um, that would completely disarm her, and it would, it, and it would it be would a win-win. Trump, Everybody wins. It would set Trump, it would set Trump up beautifully to yes. then piggyback on that to, you know, start unraveling the miasma of what he did in foreign policy in the first half of his administration with a very – um, uh, a, a series of bad decisions and um, and, and circumstances that were put laid at his feet by Jeff Sessions and other people yep. that he, um, you know, and including Jared Kushner I, and his project Netanyahu, which is a which <laughs> yeah. is a complete mess. I, I can't take yeah. credit for that one. That's Alistair Crook over at Strategic Culture had a great article earlier in the week about um, the unraveling of Project Netanyahu via uh, using the Saudis as their the tip of the spear. Yes. Um, and that's all falling apart now. And, you know, Trump is going to have to take a serious look at his foreign policy. And he's, he wants us to get out of Afghanistan. He wants to get out of Syria. Yes. Um, I agree. But I don't know that he knows now how to do it because they've so thoroughly sold him on the idea of regime change in Iran and he doesn't like to look weak. So he's kind of trapped himself on that issue. We'll see what happens. Well, and I think that, uh, slightly different angle. I think that, that Trump has really asserted himself and it began with the uh, CBS 60 Minutes interview with Leslie Stahl a few weeks ago where he, for the, the first time during his presidency, where he really took charge and he looked her right in the eye and said, you're not president, I am. And yeah. at that moment, everything, his presidency changed. And I think that we're going to see, uh, and just like the the way that he handled Jim Acosta and taking his credentials away uh, at the from the White House briefing room, right, and all of that, it's a that's a much much different stance than we saw even six months ago, eight months ago. We didn't see any of that. Mm-hmm. Now that that everything now that the midterms are over, I think that we're going to see a much much different Trump, and he's going to be a lot more assertive, and he's going to be in your face with these with these issues and. Mm-hmm. Uh, we could spend the rest of the afternoon talking about about Trump and the midterms because there's there is a lot to to dissect. one more one more meat I want to put in. Sure. I think that I think the real to me the real change came with Kavanaugh. I think Trump oh, yes. understood the win. The Kavanaugh win was going to win him the midterms. In a in how whatever he was going to win in the midterms, that was what was going to define it for him. Because a lot of never Trumpers like Lindsey Graham and others shifted sides. And I mean, Lindsey Graham is not stupid. He's a political cockroach. Right. But, um, but I think he also is really um, disgusted with what he sees going on in the Democratic Party. I don't think he wanted to believe that people he thought were his friends, which is a bad thing. You should never consider your colleagues in, in politics your friends. Dianne Feinstein is nobody's friend. No. If anybody, she's a, the only person she's a friend, the only people she's a friend to is China. Exactly. Okay. So, because they own her. Yes, they do. Right. So, yeah, I think the Kavanaugh hearings, I think Trump read that perfectly and immediately started, you know, he started dictating to his staff as well. We started seeing a lot of things change right after the Kavanaugh hearing. Fired Nikki Haley. Don't kid yourself. He fired Nikki Haley. Oh, yeah. And I think, yeah, I, I agree. Think he, and I think he fired her over one of two issues. I've said this before in other interviews. Either she passed information for, for British and French intelligence to um, create the, um, the, 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 the shoot down of the Russian plane, which almost got us into World War III, okay? that right. she was acting as a conduit, or she's the one who passed the John Huntsman op-ed to the New York Times, and Trump found out about it. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's- Either way, because John Huntsman wrote that. Um, the language is all John Huntsman. I don't then don't expect John Huntsman to be. If that's the case, don't expect Huntsman to be long as the ambassador to Russia. With Dana Rohrabacher out of out as of the, the House, he gets opened up now for a potential cabinet, you know, some kind of ambassadorship or cabinet position. I don't know how high up they can he can go, uh, given the the current in political environment. But 
Trump will reward Rohrabacher for trying to do good work during the uh, during the first half of the administration, uh, first half of the term. Um, so there's that. He fired Nikki Haley. Then uh, he's you know piggybacked on the uh, on the the Istanbul conference about between Merkel, Macron, uh, Putin, and Erdogan. Uh, piggybacked on their statement, which was a rebuke of U.S. foreign policy, U.S. policy in Syria, and said, yeah, we're getting out of Syria real soon now anyway. Don't worry about it. And that was big. And then his, the leader of the, the, the general in charge of Afghanistan said, said, quote, there's no political solution or no military solution in Afghanistan. Yeah. That's 18 years. Someone's finally admitted that. So this is, things are, things are changing. And I think, um, and then Trump sends Bolton to, uh, to talk to Putin. You know, and Bolton does his shuck and jive thing, and Trump loves leverage. So they're going to talk around the thinks that he can uh, get some leverage on the INF treaty before he sits down to talk with Putin at the G20. Putin's going to have none of it. He's going to be like, look, yeah, it's just Putin's going to have none of that. He's going to look, how many more, how many more agreements are you going to back out of, and then you want to cut a deal? No, no, no. You have to show me that you can that you can live with a deal that you don't like, because we're living with like seven or eight deals that we don't like. We've never kept an agreement. We've right. broken every agreement. The United States government yes. has broken every agreement that it's ever signed. Mm -hmm. It's ridiculous. Just ask the Native Americans. Just ask anybody. <laughs> ask Putin. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah, so I, I could see that. And and it's it's interesting because Putin and Trump are both uh, brilliant chess players. I mean, they're... In different, I would different, say, different I, would chess say I would say Trump is a very good poker player, and Putin is an excellent chess player. I don't consider Trump a very good chess player. He plays poker. He okay. bluffs an awful lot. The art of the deal is all poker. It's all reading people and leverage. It chess works. is not about that. Chess is about thinking three and four and five moves ahead. Trump is instinctual. He's not a strategic guy. He's a tactical guy that is very good at shifting his, he has an idea of what he wants to do and he's willing to shift his tactics constantly given a, uh, a changing board state. That's very much more like poker than it is chess. But he's, he, my, my point was, is that he is a, he is a strategical thinker and yeah. that he's not going to allow someone to beat him easily. And, oh no, 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 and, no. He's, and, he's going to, he's not going to allow Putin to get away with everything. Oh no, no, um, no. But he's going to have to give him some things, and it oh would, yeah, yeah, and, and what what uh, what I would find interesting, what I would love to know, was what was said to Rosenstein on Air Force One when they were on that plane for four hours, just a, a month or so ago. Oh yeah, I would love to know what was said in that conversation mm -hmm. because we haven't seen nor heard from Rosenstein since. It's like. It's like he just went poof. He stepped off the plane and and disappeared completely. He's been true. nowhere, and right. and I just wonder what what he was told. I wonder if he was told, "Well, you're about to get the Nikki Haley treatment," <laughs> yeah, or or something to that effect, or or we have we know exactly what's going on, and either you can work with us, or you can go to prison and be and be in the military tribunals along with everybody else. Because it was, it, if you go back and and uh, Sean over at SGT Report did a brilliant uh, analysis, or, or he was he was speaking with someone uh, regarding what Lindsey Graham when he had Kavanaugh for the uh, uh, confirmation, he uh, he asked him specifically about military tribunals, and that was that was incredibly important that. And it's interesting that that was brought to the table, but mm -hmm. so I think that 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 there may have been some of that conversation. I hope anyway. I I, I pray that there was some of that language used with uh, Rosenstein, and it's uh, because get it, him it to knock to, it off. What's that? They get him to knock it off. Yeah, I mean everything. You know, it's all it's all nonsense. They've they've wasted about twenty five million dollars or more on this, this, uh, garbage and just not, it, just obstruction is all that it is. It's just pure mm -hmm. obstruction. I'm, um, I'm, I'm, I'm interested to see what, I know that everybody in Washington was scared to death that Putin and Trump met privately. Yes. 
terrified. And of course, because Putin laid out for him, I'll, I'll bet you Putin laid out for Trump what was done to Russia in, 19, in the 1990s in a way that has, I mean, we're talking about Browder and the, uh, Bill Browder and the, the, the Harvard boys and Yeltsin and all that stuff. Because I'll bet you that Trump doesn't know any, didn't know any of that. Because most people don't know the story. And that's why Putin brought up Browder at the press conference. And that's why everybody went crazy afterwards. And then Putin, I think, did it on purpose. Um, and uh, because the Browder story is, you know, is, is the key to all this, it's the key to understanding Ukraine, it's the key to understanding the, the FISA warrants and the, and the Trump dossier and all this, stuff, the Skripal out poisoning, it's all tied into all this stuff. It's all tied into British intelligence in a way that I don't really, I can't like put it all together and I don't really want to. It's just very obvious that there's enough smoke and there are enough breadcrumbs. We know exactly how this works. There are better people than me working on this stuff, people like Lucy Commissar and Lee Stranahan and, and others who are putting all these pieces together. Um, and then I'll just, you know, I'll I'll do my best to try to summarize their work and then see where we're going from there at some point in the future and stay on that story because it's probably the biggest story there is because that's probably why there's such massive obstruction to all of this stuff. Yes. Because it, all of those people, and I'm talking about Mnuchin and Gary Cohn and you know, now we've got Lloyd Blankfein was the guy who was at the the meeting for one MDB over in the the Goldman Sachs guy was on Zero Hedge this afternoon yep. over Malaysia. Okay, why do you think Lloyd Blankfein all of a sudden stepped down? Yeah, because the one MDB thing was going to threaten to take Goldman Sachs down. Okay? It needs this to is, come down. And well, of course it needs to come down. It's Goldman Sachs, right? Um, so all this stuff that's out there, and it's all it's all the web of the exact same people over and over and over again. Yep. And you got to ask yourself, you know, who's protecting, you know, who, how many layers of protection do they have and how dirty are all they and how much does Trump actually know, right? And if one person on this planet has that information, it's Vladimir Putin. Because if we want to believe that the Russians, or let's just run the left's argument for a moment here. The left's argument is that the Russians are so adept at you know, common turn style infiltration of our intelligence services and our elections and this and that, all of these things. And these people are superhuman. Then they have all the information on the bad guys within the United States government. If they can hack our election to the point where they can elect Donald Trump, then don't you think they have all the information on all the bad guys as well? I mean, you have to kind of use their own, it's a Socratic method. You have to use their arguments against them. And you're like, okay, no. I mean, we got the Brits coming out and saying that half of the 150,000 Russian diaspora that live in the UK are Russian operatives. Like, do you really think the FSB is that big that those, all those people have handlers? <laughs> like, you know, let's stop and think about this for a moment. I mean, really? And why would they be so focused on the UK if they were? To have 75,000 operatives running around London when your biggest problem is the wave of, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm going to get myself in trouble if I call them what I actually think of them. Well, um, <laughs> the, the immigrants that have come to, you know, that have been allowed into and just dest and are destroying London. Yes, they have destroyed like, it. I mean, they have a they have a Muslim mayor. So yeah, well, I mean, come on, that guy uh, is that guy I, is vile. He is so vile. He, no, I mean, if Mueller had anything on Trump, he would have released it before the auction. Yes. I mean, it's that yes. simple. I mean, it, it's not yeah, hard. Yeah, because it would have destroyed him, just like what they right. tried to do with Kavanaugh. You know, the last right. minute they dropped these, you know, uh, sexual assault allegations against Kavanaugh. You know, I, you know the, the, the Kavanaugh thing was, was disgraceful, just like the was, caravans were disgraceful. Yes. I mean. And what's, what's, what's really great, Roy, you guys, this is why, part of the reason why I'm such a class half full kind of guy, right, is the, the following. Everybody knows now. Right. Okay, At, Trump has, even if Trump is not successful in draining the swamp, Trump has been, will be successful in exposing who is a member and how deep the swamp goes. And once you can see that the emperor has no clothes, then it's a short trip to everybody laughing at the emperor. And people are starting to laugh at George Soros and Tom Steyer and the rest of them. They're now, I think they're moving to that moment where Hillary Clinton doesn't want to give up. This is my, my next point. But we, I mean, but, but Soros and Sire and the rest of them have been exposed as 
the leaders behind and the the, the paymasters behind all of this stuff. Exactly. The harassment at the Kavanaugh trial, the uh, the the hearings, the the, the um, even net neutrality and all that stuff. Right. It's all Soros. Exactly. Um, and I think, and what I was going to say, what it, that had that brain freeze. Hmm. Russia has Hillary's emails. Yep. That's where, so, and you were, you were making the point that Russia knows, all, has all this information. Of course they do. They have all the dirt. That's the, in my opinion, that's one of the things that, that terrifies the uh, deep state, shadow government, whatever you want to call yep. them. That's right. what terrifies them more than anything. And I believe that that was part of that private conversation as well is what oh, yeah, is absolutely. in those emails that, that Putin right. brought that to the table and said, here's the absolute three top items that we found in those emails. And so now he has that in his back pocket, whatever it is that they gave him. And it's oh, yeah. funny that she still ha he and, hasn't look, gone and, after and, her and, yet. And, well, he couldn't. She couldn't because Jeff Sessions wouldn't allow her. Right. Um, and that's why Sessions had to go. Exactly. Um, Hillary still wants to run for president in 2020. That ain't going to happen. The Democrats don't want her to do so. She won't go away. I think the reason that she doesn't want to go away, aside from the fact that she's a bigger narcissist than Trump, <laughs> which is... That's bad. <laughs> <laughs> well, she's of the malignant kind. Trump is, a, Trump is a, not a malignant narcissist, right? He's not. He's not a malignant narcissist. Obama is a malignant narcissist. Yes. Obama is all about Obama. Okay? Obama will do anything to get what he wants. Trump still has a bit of a soul. Okay? It's tainted. It's He's easily led. He's got personality defects. We can talk about Trump until he's, you know, until we're blue and uh, until we're old and gray. And I already am old and gray. But at his core, there's still something there's still a core of humanity left in Donald Trump. And I think it's what caused him to run for president. Okay. Yeah. A desire to, I may have not led a great life to this point, but I'm going to be, before I die, I'm going to do something worthwhile. I think that, that I mean, Americans love a good redemption story and I'm, and, and I'm susceptible to that narrative as much as anybody else. But you know, that to me scans with what I'm seeing. Okay. Hillary is irredeemable. She's Emperor Palpatine with a colostomy bag. Um, and it's, it, it, that's, which is obvious at this point. And, and so it's, you know, she and George Soros should just get together and get it, get it over and done with. Right. So, um, Hillary is refuses to believe that she's not a good candidate and she doesn't want to give up control of the democratic party and she doesn't want to give up the any of the power and i think it's for two reasons one if she thinks she she can win she can sweep all this under the rug and she can exactly. you know fulfill her life's mission right and get back at all of her enemies and all of that stuff and mm -hmm. and so i think that's just what's going on here and the democrats i think are going to throw her under the bus we're already starting to see it we're starting to see them say things like well it was hillary that issued X, Y, and Z. We're starting to see stuff like that. Hillary, go away. We don't want you to be our standard bearer in 2020. You know, there's going to come a point, and I've always, and I said this right after the election. I used to talk about this with my friend Halsey English all the time. It's a, it's a narrative. It's a, it's a, a point that I haven't made in well over a year. And so now I'm kind of remind, as I talk about this, I'm reminding myself, which is to say that in order to get rid of Hillary, Trump can't lead that charge. That's not politically the way to go. The way to go is to get Hillary into such a position where she won't go away and her own people want to get rid of her. Yeah. And then all Trump has to do is stand out of the, stay out of the way and just go, well, okay, if that's what you guys want. This is what we'll do. And that's what's going to happen. Hillary's going to effectively indict herself. And when the Democrats get out of the way of allowing, of allowing Trump to go after her, then you know that the, that's that's when you know everything is changing. That's when you know that they're done with her and she's going to be the scapegoat for everything bad. She has to be that person because she's so hated by so many people. And um, yes, she is. And what's interesting, I think, is going back to our original point about the, the midterms, is that we 
elected Donald Trump because we hated her. We didn't really vote for Trump. Some of us voted for Trump. I voted for Trump because I just thought it would be, and not only did I just think it was, everything was intolerable, but I also thought it would be entertaining. And I generally don't <laughs> vote, right? Because I don't like to encourage them, right? It was libertarian creed, don't vote, it only encourages them. Um, but I, I, I also knew that it would be entertaining, that Trump would drive them all batty and that some good would come out of that. And maybe he'll not be a half bad president, right? So far, I think, I think he's people, doing. I think, I think he's doing people, all right. Yeah, I think he's doing fine. I mean, given who he is and what he is and everything else, and I run down his pluses and minuses, and I look at the situation, and I go, and his biases, and how old he is, and who. Yeah, you know, I just, I, I go, yeah, it's that's about what I expected. It's not as much as I wanted or I hoped for, but it's not terrible, right? The foreign policy stuff is a mess, but he can he can it's clean a disaster, that up. Yeah, um, yeah, and hopefully he will. Right. And hopefully he will. Um, and if he doesn't, then we'll take him to the woodshed in 2020. I, I will turn on Trump on foreign policy if he does not get better real soon now. Um, but I'll still support him domestically. Again, criticize them for the things they do wrong. Reward them for the things they do right. Just like yes, raising your kids. Exactly. Right? Ignore, your, ignore the bad behavior. Reward the good behavior. It's just like raising dogs. <laughs> okay, so I uh, hate <laughs> hate to be flipped, but it really does kind of come down to that. Um, but you know, the 2016 election was about no Hillary. We'll take anything, and we'll take. Okay, we we'll get Donald Trump. That's who we got. Okay, we'll take that. That's you know that's and that was the deciding factor in this election. I think what we said at the beginning of the outset of this is that the 2018 um, midterms were a Trump's doing a pretty pretty good job. And we like him. We still don't like the GOP. Those yes. people we don't trust. Yeah, we don't trust so them because, the they are, because the they're still politicians. Right. Those are still politicians. They're career politicians for the most part. We don't like them. And they need to go. But we like Trump. We like Trump. But, yeah, let's get rid of, let's turn the, but, you know, we gave them everything. And they didn't do anything with it. So, right. okay, the Democrats get a turn. So the Democrats, though, are going to. As they always do, and this is the most important point about the midterms, the Democrats will and already are assuming the wrong thing about this election. They're going to look at this like they always do, that this is an affirmation of their um, taking the A train to crazy town. That their policy of going full bore identity politics, cultural Marxism, higher taxes, insane climate change, all of this stuff. That's what people want. The people want Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Yes. And we're going to give it to them. We're going to give it to them and, and buy, buy the truckload. And, right. and, and, and when they do and, that, and they're going to destroy And then they're going to be blindsided when Trump wins in a Reagan-like second term versus Mondale. And the Republicans wind up with 60 seats in the Senate and a 50-seat majority in the House. And they'll be like, how in the hell did that happen? Yep. And it won't matter how much money there is. They pump right. it. Because lies are expensive to maintain. The telling the truth is cheap. There you go. Well, we've been speaking with uh, Tom Luongo. And you can find all of Tom's great work over at TomLuongo.me. And the, his work falls under the banner of Gold, Goats, and Guns. Tom, this has been an unbelievable pleasure, and I really hope that we can do it again in the not too distant future. I'd be happy to, Rory. I had a blast. I would, you know, I always enjoy doing stuff like this. It's fun. This is great. So uh, I'm not going to take up any more of your time, and I certainly appreciate all that you've given us. And have a wonderful afternoon. You too, sir. You take care. Have a great weekend.